Yer, yer. Welcome, bike, and happy Halloween. It's the waiver wire video of the week every single Tuesday, so make sure you are subscribed. What did you guys dress up as for Halloween? I'm curious. I feel like people overthink it, and then they don't end up dressing up. Just get something simple. Just get Winnie the Pooh. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna do a giveaway. I'm gonna give away a free uh, BDG shirt to whoever's costume I like the most. Comment down below what you dressed up this year for as uh, for Halloween. And if you lie, I'm gonna know. All right. We're not here to lie, though. We're here to tell you how much money you should spend on the waiver wire this week. If you are in leagues that have fab, we have specific fab suggestions up on the website right now, bdge.co. You'll get our waiver wire rankings. They'll be live by the time you watch this video. We've got our waiver wire rankings, our weekly rankings, our private Q&A every Saturday to help you just get starts. That's if you're a big dog member on bdge.co. If you're not, if you just want the free content, you're also in the right place. This is what we do every single week. We head over to the trending tab on Sleeper to talk about the hottest trending players. Make sure we're talking about the people that people are talking about. You know what I mean? So we'll jump into the trending up. We'll jump into the trending down and tell you who you can drop as well. I would say we tuck in our shirts, but you goddamn know this is a onesie. So there's nothing to tuck into right now. Nothing to tuck. I came tucked. I came prepared. So this is going to be a dangerous episode. <laughs> We we'll talk about dangerous. We'll talk about the top guy on the list right now is Will Levis. He torched, absolutely torched my Atlanta Falcons. Took a blowtorch right to them. It was basically like, okay, started the game, hit one pass. And that was his way of like, okay, he went out on a sunny day, magnifying glass. We're sitting there on the on the on the pavement. It's hot as hell, and maybe there's some sparks flowing. And then all of a sudden, he was like, ah, fuck it. You know what? I'm just gonna annihilate this ant and hit him with the blowtorch. That's what he did. He threw for four touchdowns. Not all of them were great. Uh, D Hop probably did some things that Prime D Hop would do, and and made sure that those walupas that that motherfucker threw came down and finished at scores. He threw the ball great though; like he was completing passes down the field. He was accurate in the short parts of the field. Will Levis look great? Um, I I can't imagine they're going to throw Tannehill back out there if he is healthy. But I have heard rumors and reports that like it it is a possibility. Either way, if he's available in your Superflex League, you are dropping the bank if you need a quarterback because quarterbacks do not become available often in Superflex Leagues, especially ones with four touchdown weekly type upside. So you are blowing the budget on Mr. Will Levis. The other thing to know, just in terms of like the week in general, this is an awful waiver wire week, unless you need a tight end. Unless you need a tight end, this week stinks. And Trey McBride might already be owned. He is, without a doubt, the top waiver wire ad of the week for me. Trey McBride, in his first game, his first start without Zach Ertz, this dude goes 10 for 95 and a touchdown on 14 targets, right? He was the Mackey Award winner. He was the first tight end drafted in the draft last year. This dude is oozing with talent, and he finally got to show it a little bit. They let him run rampant. He ran all of the routes. And not only do I think he's immediately plugged in as like a top target earner and an every week plug and play top 12 tight end one for fantasy, but I think he's got even more upside with Kyler returning likely in week 10 or after that. So Trey McBride, he is a dude that I would blow pause. I would spend a lot of fab dollars um, on if I need a tight end. If I'm in a tight end premium league where I could flex him, I think he's absolutely viable as well. Taysom Hill is probably a lot less practical. He's only owned in 42% of leagues apparently on sleeper. But I think anyone who's like really, really playing fantasy is probably not available. But realistically, I would actually rank Taysom Hill over Trey McBride if he's sitting there and I would I blow up to 50% of my fab on Taysom Hill because this dude has finished as the tight end two the tight end five and the tight end nine over the last three weeks and that tight end two came this previous week where he was playing while Juwan Johnson returned so this is very sticky his role you can't really pre his role is sticky but you can't actually predict how the production can't predict the production you know what I'm saying so Taysom Hill and Trey McBride if you go over to my waiver wire rankings and you look at the fab suggestions, they are a top of the list and it is not even close because the running backs stink. The most interesting running back, I think most of y'all would probably say would be Uncle Lenny. Playoff Lenny, Uncle Lenny, I don't know, whatever the fuck you want to call it, about to be irrelevant Lenny for the seventh time in his career. He signs with the Buffalo Bills. This feels like, okay, Damian Harris went on the IR. We need another running back to share the load with Latavius Murray, I guess. Latavius Murray and Fournette's skill set, they kind of feel a little bit redundant to me. I guess if they felt comfortable with Latavius, they wouldn't have signed Leonard Fournette. So this does feel like he has the opportunity to become the number two there behind James Cook. James Cook's getting a lot of touches, man. He's getting like 15 touches a game. Latavius Murray's role is not great. Uh, can Fournette be the goal line back there? Sure. But again, like Latavius will probably still get a couple of those. Josh Allen is still a guy on the goal line. 
I don't know if we'll ever get to a point where we can trust even close to trust uh, Leonard Fournette here. So like kind of exciting, I guess, if uh, like if you love missionary, but I have him as like a five to eight percent fab guy, Leonard Fournette. He's not even my top running back. Like these guys are probably very, very highly owned. I think I don't even know if they're actually on this list. So if they're not on this list then yeah, they're wildly highly owned unless I missed them. But Zach Charbonnet and Tajay Spears, like if that if handcuff running backs are the top, you know, waiver wire targets of the week, it's a shitty week. Um, they need to be very, very, very much owned. We saw Zach Charbonnet have a big role, actually a bigger role than Kenneth Walker, but I'm going to chalk that up to probably Kenneth Walker's midweek calf injury and not actually think that that's going to be sticky or something that we can expect going forward. But both those guys need to be owned. We have the trade deadline coming up. Maybe Derrick Henry gets moved. Um, that is 4 p.m. Eastern time today, so about four hours after I'm filming this. If anything like huge, huge happens, I'll probably make another kind of like breaking news on demand type video for it and cover my thoughts on it. But for right now, I don't expect Derrick Henry to be moved. We, those are guys you're just hanging on to that everyone just keeps saying the same thing. If that guy gets hurt, he's going to play more. So, you know, you obviously want to own those dudes. Rashid Shaheed. He's probably the top waiver wire wide receiver of the week. Uh, I mean, there's nothing else left to be said about him. Everyone knows everything about him. He's a big play waiting to happen. He went three for 153. What I thought was kind of interesting was in week six and seven, he started to become an 80 to 85% snap guy. So he's playing a full-time role. Week seven, it didn't lead to much production. And then week eight, his role diminished. He only ran 50% of the routes, but that ended up being the three for 153 game on three targets. So he caught all of them. You know, you know what Rashid Jaheed is. He might hit on a big play or he might absolutely bust for you. But he's a good receiver that I think you can absolutely use in flex plays. They get to play against Chicago, which is a great, great matchup. And you have Derek Carr, who's right underneath him, who I think is a great streaming option too at quarterback. He has put up 300 passing yards in three straight games. So it's been ugly, but he's getting, he's putting down the statistics. He's putting it down. I guess we got to talk about the QB situation in Minnesota. Kirk's out for the year which kind of leaves Jaron Hall a day three pick as their only quarterback right now. But there's been rumors about Jameis Winston going to Minnesota. That would be cool as fuck. I would actually really, really like that. I, I feel like they're going to bring in a veteran one way or another. I know on the Underdog Fantasy Podcast, Josh Norris, who is a host of the fan, uh, Underdog Fantasy Podcast, also does a weekly podcast with Colt McCoy. And he said that Colt McCoy was actually brought in for a visit a few weeks ago to Minnesota. This was prior to the Kirk injury. And him and Kevin O'Connell have a great relationship. So don't be surprised if he gets a call from Minnesota. If someone like on the Colt McCoy level of veteran slash skill slash talent slash whatever they have left in the tank type beat ends up being the guy that they bring in um, if they don't end up going the trade route there. And I think whoever that is, is worth owning. Jaron Hall is not the, he's probably the opposite of the long-term solution. He's probably the short-term problem, I, I would say that that might be accurate. He he could struggle pretty immensely, I think, if he's thrown into this role. But if a veteran comes in like a Colt McCoy, I think there'll be a decent like super flex floor for you there, just given the fact that they have you know uh, a really good supporting cast and Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson and KJ Osborne's been playing great and Justin Jefferson will hopefully, I think, eventually will be back this year. So you know if a Colt gets picked up, I think this this might be the time to like throw a zero percent fab bid on some of those veterans like Colt, and, and kind of see where it lands. Demaro Douglas is sneaky like my favorite ad at wide receiver this week because you have Kendrick Bourne, who has a torn ACL, is out for the year. You have Devontae Parker, who left with a head injury, so maybe concussion, he's out for a week or so. And they have nothing else on that roster. Like, he is kind of forced into an every-down role now. 62% of the snaps in Week 7, 4 for 54. This week, obviously, that went really high up because of the injuries. He went five for 25, um, but if you're playing full PPR, like he's starting to catch a lot of balls and he's getting a lot of targets and he's an explosive player. He ran like a four, 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 40 or something like that. Um, so he can kind of fit into that quick, agile, explosive slot receiver that Mac Jones and just the Patriots have relied on year over year. So I actually really, really like Demario Douglas in PPR type leagues. Doesn't have a lot of touch on upside. Half PPR makes it a lot less interesting, but I think he's a flex filling guy for you. As we move down, you have Jahan Dotson, who's over 50% owned. Khalil Shakir is 5% owned. Now, Shakir had a big game in the one in the first week that they had no Dawson Knox. Now, he went 6 for 92, 6 targets, so a breakout game relative to whatever he's done at this point. And I was looking at some of the formations and stuff, and with Dawson Knox out, Dawson Knox on the IR, so he's missing at least three more games. Dalton Kincaid obviously had his breakout game. Gabe Davis and Stephon Diggs both had huge games, too. And I don't think Shakir moves out the pecking order. I still think he's the fourth option. If you count James Cook, then the fifth option there. If you count Uncle Leonard, 
than the sixth option there. You know what I'm saying? Hill Shakir is, I think he's medium-sized talented. I think he's extra medium. I don't think he's anything like groundbreaking or fantastic or whatever. But he's in a role now where they ran three wide receiver sets over 80% of the time in their game against Tampa Bay. They ran 12 personnel, which is two tight ends, prior to this week at a clip of like 30%. So Knox and Kincaid were both on the field together often. This previous week, they did not run a single 12 personnel tight end set, um, which was just Kincaid. So that opens up to see a lot more three wide receiver sets, obviously. And that becomes interesting for a guy like Shakir. Because when you're just attached to Josh Allen, and this defense has, I don't want to say plummeted, but they've dealt with a fuck ton of injuries, which means that other teams can score against them, obviously. That opens things up for Allen to pass more, just this offense to pass more and have more targets. So Shakir's cool. I think he's like, uh, he, he's a guy I would probably spend between, you know, six, eight, ten percent on. Um, I, I think like last week was probably the upside case for him. And I don't imagine we're going to see a ton of like huge weeks for him. They have Cincinnati, Denver, Jets, Philly, by Casey, Dallas, Charge, New England. So a mixed match of like some good games, some bad games. But I still think he's going to be the fourth target, if not lower in this offense on a weekly basis. But he, de- he definitely should be stashed because you have that unknown upside. You don't get a lot of guys where, you know, you, you have the Jahan Dotsons here. You have the Rashid Jaheed here. You have a lot of players that we're kind of used to already that we know what they're going to give you on a daily basis or a weekly basis, I should say. And Clue Shakir kind of, who knows? What if Shakir takes over the wide receiver two role over the second half of the year? What if he out-targets Gabe Davis second half of the year? You know, these things, they're, they're possibilities. They they can absolutely happen. Oh, I'm an idiot. Okay, so Minnesota does have Nick Mullins. There's a possibility that they use him instead of Jaron Hall there. Um, I don't know why I forgot about him. But I also think there's a possibility they're bringing another veteran too. So, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not putting a lot of money on either of these guys. I think I might actually prefer Mullins here. Who else we got? All these guys are very highly owned. Jameis Winston is being picked up on the speculation, on the speculation that he could go to Minnesota. Yeah, man, this is just an ugly and ugly and ugly week. Uh, one other thing I do want to say about like Gardner Minshew and the Indianapolis Colts is this team has turned into like a full shootout mode team. They are currently scoring the sixth most points per game just as an offensive unit, and it's because they're allowing the single most points per game, okay? They are terrible on defense. They're allowing so many points, and it's forcing Gardner Minshew in this offense to throw the ball a ton. So no real takeaways is not like Mike Taylor's not available. Zach Moss is probably not available. Josh Downs not available. Michael Pittman not available. But I just think it's noted that because I, I kind of think of like a Colts team as maybe wishy-washy, a little bit up and down, a little bit inconsistent, a team that you don't really know what you're going to get on a week-to-week basis. But I think we're starting to kind of understand that that might not be true just because of how much of a funnel this defense leading into an offense is at the moment. Um, Donald Parham can be a sneaky pickup at tight end if Gerald Everett continues to be out. First game without Everett, 5 for 4, 43, and a touchdown. Obviously, against Chicago Bears, get a much tougher matchup against the New York Jets, so not one I'm looking to get into my lineup immediately. Mitch Trubisky is another like, super flex guy we probably need to talk about because they play, they play at home against Tennessee on Thursday night. So this game is coming quickly and you have Kenny Pickett dealing with a rib contusion. I believe that's just like a pain tolerance thing, so it's possible that Kenny Pickett does end up playing. Mitch Trubisky is not an exciting start whatsoever, but Tennessee's pass defense is not good. They can definitely be had. They can definitely be taken advantage of. They can definitely be a team where Mitch runs the ball a little bit and throws a couple touchdowns here, so you can kind of do worse, I think, if you're really desperate for a quarterback. Um, Jaden Reed should definitely be owned with the fact that just like Christian Watson is flopping all over the place. I believe he leads the team in just overall target share right now, and he's making big plays. So he's a dude you can actually throw into your lineup and probably expect a floor of about seven fantasy points on a weekly basis. And yeah, that's that's really it in terms of like guys that are under 50, 40 percent owned down here. Uh, Kyler Murray should be stashed for sure. He should be back sooner rather than later. When we move over to the other side of things in terms of the trending down, obviously, if there's a guy I don't think you should drop, then I will call him out. Curtis Samuel, I would wait to hear the injury report. Uh, Jameson Crowder, I'm surprised, actually was not on the pickup list whatsoever. Curtis Samuel entered the game with a foot injury. He left with a toe injury. So if it's turf toe, it could be a multi-week thing, but he's been like force-fed targets and he's been kind of good this is a full ppr league these points here but 11 6 7 18 18 14 6 6 so never never lower than six and obviously that's not what you want out of like a flex play but still giving you games of you know 14 to 18 semi-consistently against bad defenses atlanta chicago philadelphia can be passed on um, new england i do expect 
Sam Howell and the Washington offense to struggle at New England and Foxborough. But uh, Curtis Samuel probably shouldn't be dropped until we know what his actual injury designation is. He's undergoing further examination on his injured foot, so it's possible that he is inactive and or just limited throughout the week and playing at less than 100%. But obviously, that makes the guy across from him over here, Jahan Dotson, a little bit spicier. I know everyone's going to be like, oh, we're back with Jahan Dotson, 8 for 108 and a touchdown. Again, I will relay. He had 10 targets, but Sam Howell did throw the ball 52 times, so that is still like an 18% target share. If Curtis Samuel's out, obviously, we'd like that a little bit more for Jahan Dotson, but Jameson Crowder also got like seven, eight, nine targets. Uh, I'm not running to the fucking wire to pick up Jameson Crowder because he's Jameson Crowder, but thought it should be mentioned. Uh, I would hold on to Miles Sanders. I, there's a there's a there's a possibility that he's actually just like straight up injured still. They gave him twenty five million dollars this offseason, so I don't think they're going to phase him out. Jeff Wilson, I was kind of like never really on the bandwagon of of uh, getting excited to pick him back up. We did see him get seven touches this weekend, but they have a bye coming up soon. They also have Devon A. Chan coming back soon, so I don't I don't know if he ever gets really back involved. I would hold on to Jameson Williams. I would hold on to Roshan Johnson. I would hold on to Elijah Mitchell because we did have C-Mac back this week, and Elijah Mitchell was the only other running back to receive a touch over Jordan Mason. So it does feel like now that Elijah Mitchell is healthy, he becomes the handcuff to C-Mac. So that would obviously be an unbelievably valuable role to have if uh, if C-Mac were to get hurt. Ty J Spears definitely needs to be held on to. Um, Josh Palmer left the game. I believe he came back, so uh, he definitely doesn't need to be dropped. Everyone else on this list, I think, can be dropped, except for Tank Dell. I'm not dropping Tank Dell. Like I said, I think Noah Brown coming back had a bigger impact, but Tank Dell's bigger games are for show coming. And that's the waiver wire video for this week. I'm about to go trick or treating. No, I'm not. No, I'm absolutely not. I'm not going trick or treating. Unless, unless. All right, well, if you want all of our fab suggestions, if you want our waiver wire rankings, they will be available to y'all on bdge.co. You become a big dog member. You get the waiver wire rankings. You get our weekly sit start rankings. You get access to our private Q and assault live stream every Saturday where you can ask me any questions you may have. And you get access to our private discord. And that product table will be expanding throughout the off season into some dynasty products and services as well. So go sign up on bdge.co. I will see y'all tomorrow for our trade target video. Subscribe, bitch.